Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Radu Palinescu. I'm professor of computer science at the University of York and the principal investigator on the research project organizing this seminar series on the resilience of autonomous systems. And today I have the uh, great pleasure of uh, introducing our uh, speaker, Professor Rafaela Mirandola from uh, the Department of Electronics, uh, uh, Informatics and uh, Bioengineering at the Politecnico di Milano. Rafaela is a uh, close collaborator of mine. We have worked together for many years now. And uh, uh, she shares uh, research interests in software quality requirements, engineering, analysis, verification. She is working on formal methods for self-adaptive dependable IT systems, model-driven software engineering, and uh, the application of the theories, approaches, and techniques from these areas to service-oriented and component-based systems. Now, today's talk that she will present is uh, on a new piece of research that she's been uh, doing uh, in collaboration uh, with Vincenzo and uh, Diego. And uh, this will be on uh, uh, characterization of anti-fragile systems. Please, Rafael. Thank you. Thank you, Radu, for the nice introduction. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. As uh, Radu was saying, uh, today I will present uh, um, some uh, results of uh, an ongoing work. And uh, I would like to highlight the ongoing part uh, we are doing with uh, Vincenzo and uh, Diego about the characterization of uh, antifragile systems. So today we live uh, uh, in, in a world in which uh, more or less everything is uh, guided by, uh, by software. So uh, we are accustomed to see uh, software intensive system. We know that they are uh, complex systems, that uh, they work uh, continuously, even uh, at least we would like that. Uh, even uh, under uh, changing operating condition. And, uh, but sometimes these changes uh, lead to um, a degradation in uh, system quality, or also uh, there is the possibility for the system to, to fail. There are manual or ad hoc approaches that can be used, but of course, uh, these are prone uh, to errors and uh, require time. Well, we started already. So, uh, um, okay. <laughs> Uh, the, the question, uh, one of the main uh, research question underlying uh, this uh, uh, field of research is how to be able uh, to, engin to engineer software intensive systems that uh, work in the expected way, achieve their quality despite uh, the occurrence of uh, changes. And uh, um, a lot of work, has been done uh, in the past. Uh, of course, starting uh, with the definition of what quality is and uh, defining uh, the different kind of uh, quality attributes that uh, can change according to the system of interest. So we can have uh, response time, energy consumption, uh, security, dependability, and uh, many others. And, uh, and then also uh, in the literature, uh, you can find a lot of uh, approaches trying to um, automatize uh, at least uh, partially uh, the evaluation of uh, quality uh, approaches that are based on software performance or reliability engineering or uh, based on the exploitation of formal methods or simulation and empirical uh, evaluation and more recently also on uh, self-adaptive systems. In uh, today, uh, I will focus on dependability and uh, I will uh, recall uh, the, the definition given by Avizienis and uh, colleagues in 2004 in their seminal work and the dependability is defined as the ability of a system uh, to deliver service that can be uh, justifiably be trusted. Together with uh, the definition of dependability, 
they also uh, offered a taxonomy uh, organized uh, uh, around the three main uh, pillars, uh, uh, the attributes characterizing the dependability, uh, threats uh, that can impair dependability, and the means uh, to attain uh, dependability. Together with the taxonomy, they also define uh, the chain of dependability threats, uh, the famous fault, error, and failure that uh, uh, we are using uh, today, uh, today as well. But uh, after, uh, from 2004, several other terms uh, were introduced to uh, describe the behavior uh, of system in the presence of fault, for example, robustness, uh, resilience, recoverability, self-healing, uh, just uh, to name a few, and more recently also uh, anti-fragility. Uh, antifragility, an antifragile system is a system which is able to improve its behavior and its quality after a change. And uh, of course, uh, this is different with respect to fragile system that uh, break when uh, a change happens, or dependable system which are able to resist shock, but at the end remain the same. And so uh, with this uh, proliferation of uh, terms that are used to define similar or uh, equivalent uh, concept, um, Idienis says that uh, uh, we have a jungle of uh, terminology in his paper uh, that is cited in this slide. And uh, this jungle can make difficult or, or at least confusing reasoning about uh, system and their quality. So we believe that uh, um, for a software uh, engineer to be able uh, to design a trustworthy system, uh, it is necessary to have uh, a commonly agreed on repertoire of terms and uh, corresponding underlying concepts, which make clear uh, which system aspect uh, each term intend to capture and also the relationship between the different uh, terms. So uh, the definition of the dependability taxonomy uh, I showed you before uh, certainly represents a notable result in this direction, but uh, and, and so uh, it has also been used in the past to uh, include some other terms. But antifragility, uh, with this aspect of improvement after a, chain, uh, a change, brings with it a new vision. And so our question is, is it possible to integrate this new vision into uh, the dependability taxonomy? And uh, if so, is it necessary to uh, change, uh, change it, update, expand, or what uh, is necessary? So to, to reason in this uh, direction, uh, we started uh, defining a conceptual framework to, uh, to have uh, uh, clear reference uh, uh, terms. So, so we have a system uh, which is denoted uh, with S and uh, Sigma, where S uh, represents the set of system components, hardware and software, and their attribute, uh, while Sigma represents a specific value of this attribute, also called the system uh, states. Then we have the environment in which uh, uh, the system uh, works and with which uh, it interacts. The environment is denoted with uh, E and uh, eta. Uh, similarly, here uh, represents uh, the element and the attribute of the environment, uh, while eta represents a specific value of these, uh, uh, of these attributes. And then, uh, as for every system, we have uh, uh, a list of uh, expectation of system uh, stakeholders called requirements covering both functional and non-functional aspects. And uh, the quality of the system 
uh, depends on its uh, ability uh, to fulfilling the requirement in the given environment. However, uh, to be able to uh, assess uh, uh, the, the quality of uh, our system, um, we, we make uh, uh, assumption and uh, these assumptions are uh, uh, related to the level of knowledge that we have uh, uh, of our system and of the uh, environment. And uh, so to be able to, to reason about the quality of our system, we introduce uh, also a model denoted with uh, uh, M and mu with the same characteristics with M, uh, we denote uh, uh, both the system and the environment components and attributes uh, while mu uh, defines specific value of uh, uh, this attribute. The, the model as usual um, represents the system at a given uh, abstraction level, uh, including the knowledge that we have at the moment uh, about uh, uh, this is uh, about uh, the system. So um, at this point, given our model and the requirement, we are able to define uh, a satisfaction metric that we call uh, QR and uh, which allow us to uh, evaluate the quality of uh, uh, the system in uh, the given environment. For example, uh, it can uh, measure how large uh, with respect uh, to the given requirement is the subset of properties that uh, our system is able to uh, fulfill in this environment. And this satisfaction metric is defined in some suitable metric space uh, so that we can associate an, orderly, an ordering relation uh, to be able to compare different uh, model and different uh, quality in this way. Okay, just to be a little bit more uh, concrete, um, I show you uh, a very uh, simple example, example, which has been inspired by uh, the Anti-Fragile ICT System book. Uh, in this example, we have a set of uh, distributed nodes that can be uh, computer, uh, sensor, mobile robots, IO devices, whatever, uh, which are connected to accomplish some kind of uh, service. And uh, the, the connection the, between the network topology is uh, dynamic because uh, nodes can uh, appear and uh, disappear. And uh, the software hosted by the node uh, can be uh, attacked uh, both from, uh, um, from the environment, um, but also uh, can be attacked uh, from uh, other internal nodes. And so for this uh, system example, the notation we have introduced so far uh, is, uh, can be simply instantiated uh, as uh, represent uh, the different system nodes with their attribute, while sigma uh, denotes the system connection and uh, vulnerability and describe also the infection status of the nodes. Uh, the environment E include the set of possible uh, cyber attack vectors, while HITA uh, describe the specification of which are currently active and also the frequency with which each attack uh, can be tried uh, against a node. Uh, possible example of uh, quality requirements are, um, can be the system should keep uh, on average 95% of its node healthy and also each node should be connected to at least uh, two uh, nodes. Given this system, sorry, a possible uh, example model uh, is a, a graph uh, made of vec uh, sorry of nodes and uh, edge, where each node 
describe uh, um, the name, the kind of software which is uh, installed, uh, some attribute, uh, for example, the status of uh, infection, and also uh, the mean healing time. And of course, the edge represents the connection between the different nodes. And then we have the vulnerability of um, this uh, system, for example, uh, we have the first vulnerability which uh, um, concern uh, the installed software uh, view in version V1 with a given probability of, of attack. And uh, similarly, we can see another kind of vulnerability here. And uh, a possible, very simple, in this case, satisfaction metric for the requirement we have defined before and for this given model uh, is the one is shown here. So the satisfaction metric uh, is one when both requirements are fulfilled, 0 0.5 if only one of the two requirements is fulfilled or zero uh, otherwise. So Starting from, uh, we have now the, uh, the system, we have the environment, we have the requirement, and uh, we have uh, the models. We say from the beginning that these systems uh, are subject to changes because uh, the environment uh, is uncertain, because uh, uh, something uh, not planned uh, can happen. And so our uh, study now uh, proceed trying to understand how these changes affect uh, the systems and the models and how they impact the dependability concept. To do so, we try to characterize the different type of changes uh, according to the place in which uh, they happen. So we start uh, with the real changes. So the changes that happen in the system or uh, in the environment. And uh, uh, depending on um, their scope, uh, we uh, distinguish between between two different uh, types of changes. In the first one, um, only the value of uh, some system or environment uh, attribute um, can change. And so in this case, uh, these type of changes can be represented by this uh, transition in which uh, you can see on the left side that the new uh, version of uh, uh, the sigma, eta, and mu is denoted with a prime. And then the second type of real changes instead introduce a, a new version of the system or the environment, um, introducing a partially different set uh, of elements or modifying some uh, of uh, elements that already exist. And so again, this type of change can be represented by a transition like that. And on the left side, we see that uh, every uh, element uh, can change except for the uh, requirement. And uh, what about the quality? Well, uh, the quality of the original system, our satisfaction metric was defined uh, um, for the requirement R and uh, the model M and mu, but now we have changes in the, uh, in, in the model. And so we will have uh, two different satisfaction metrics. The satisfaction metrics will change. And then uh, it is necessary to see if uh, the requirements are uh, fulfilled uh, again. Graphically, very, in a very simple way, this is uh, the starting point. And when a change happens, uh, both in the environment or uh, in the system, uh, then uh, this uh, uh, should lead, can lead to uh, a change in the model. Of course, uh, uh, if uh, uh, what happened in the system was captured in the model before. To go back to our uh, example, um, 
An example of the first uh, type of uh, real change uh, is uh, uh, a change uh, in an attribute value. And as you can see, an healthy node uh, become infected. Uh, while uh, um, an example of uh, the second type of real change uh, is illustrated here when you see that we now have uh, two different types uh, of nodes with different uh, healing uh, process with respect to the uh, starting um, starting system so uh, real changes are changes that happen in the system or in the environment and now we have uh, something which is uh, known as well we have requirement uh, changes in this case uh, there are properties that are added uh, or removed or removed and uh, this kind of change can be represented by this kind of transition uh, where the uh, requirement are uh, are changed and of course also in this case and the satisfaction uh, metric uh, QR uh, will change because uh, we have now new uh, set of requirement. So this change in the requirement uh, lead to a change in the uh, quality, in the satisfaction metric. And uh, if uh, uh, the requirements are not met, this could lead to a system evolution trying to, uh, to have a new system that uh, meets uh, the new requirement. Um, in our example, we can imagine, um, for example, a modification in the stakeholder preferences on the system healthiness, so much, even simple a change in the, in the percentage of uh, healthy node or uh, the emergence of a new stakeholder who introduce a new property that uh, the system uh, should satisfy. So real change and requirement changes are something that uh, more or less we already know, but uh, what is usually not uh, considered are changes that happen at the model level and that we uh, denoted as uh, knowledge uh, changes. These are changes that uh, affect uh, only the model, uh, happen at the model level, and they are related to the fact that we are acquiring, we have acquired in some way, new knowledge that change our perception of the system and the environment that remain the same. So, for example, uh, it is possible that we acquire new knowledge that lead to a modification of the some attribute uh, of uh, our model, so leading to a transition of uh, this type. Or again, we can um, have a new observation, new data that lead uh, to the modification of the system um, uh, itself, adding or removing element, and so uh, having a transition uh, um, of this type. Of course, also in this case, the satisfaction metric uh, will change with respect uh, to the original one, possibly leading to uh, non-satisfaction of uh, the requirement. So what is different uh, with respect to this kind of change with respect to the other ones? Uh, here, new knowledge is acquired about the model and uh, a new model is uh, created. And uh, if uh, the requirements are not met, these should hopefully lead to a system evolution, which is uh, and so to a new system, which is uh, better uh, with respect to the uh, starting one. Let's go back to our example. This was uh, our model, uh, nodes and uh, vulnerability. And um, one uh, uh, knowledge change of the first type could be, for example, a change in the value of the probability attack or another kind of change could be that 
uh, with the uh, observation uh, done uh, um, on the system, we discovered that uh, the first type of vulnerability does not in fact only one kind of node, one kind of software, but also another one. So what does this mean? Uh, it means that when uh, uh, this vulnerability, um, this vector attack, not only node one will be infected as uh, uh, we expected from our original model, but also model two, and then uh, accordingly model node four, five, three, and four, uh, because they are connected to node uh, two. So the model that uh, we had before uh, is uh, uh, no longer able uh, to uh, correctly model uh, the, the system. So having seen this, uh, different type of changes, and that uh, they can, they, all of them, lead to a change in uh, the, satis the quality satisfaction metrics. Um, so poss possibly they also uh, lead the system in a state uh, which is not uh, correct anymore. Uh, so we are trying uh, to understand if uh, these changes uh, are indeed, uh, can be included in the treats uh, in our dependability um, taxonomy. And to this end, we compare what we have defined as changes with the faults. So the first step is to understand if real changes, requirement changes, and knowledge changes can be classified as faults. Indeed, all of them, as I have said just a moment before, lead to a state which is not uh, correct with respect uh, to the system, and so uh, they lead the system in a narrow state. And so changes like uh, faults uh, can be seen as uh, triggers uh, for the chain of dependability threats uh, uh, that we have seen at the beginning. Um, so changes can be seen like faults, and now faults uh, are able to cover all the types of changes we have uh, uh, described so far. Um, well, uh, the taxonomy includes uh, development, physical, and uh, interaction faults, and uh, uh, they cover nicely uh, real changes and also requirement changes because they can be seen as a sort of external faults that are included in the interaction faults. But uh, the knowledge changes uh, are not included uh, in uh, the taxonomy. And so here comes the first extension uh, to the taxonomy we are proposing. Uh, we propose to include the changes as a threat together with faults. And uh, uh, while the development physical and interaction uh, cover changes, real changes and requirement changes, we uh, propose to add uh, another type of uh, change, the, uh, knowledge one in the taxonomy, so to be able uh, to cover also uh, changes of type 3A and 3B that uh, I described before. So given uh, this uh, new type of change, um, are the means to attain uh, dependability uh, still uh, enough, at least the one uh, that exists? We expect that fault prevention, tolerance, removal, and uh, forecasting can be uh, adopted uh, to deal with real and requirement uh, changes. But uh, uh, what about uh, the knowledge changes? So they... Uh, lead to a better understanding of the system. And so they, and also its environment, of course. And so a knowledge change here is able to um, 
move the, the system um, from uh, a model M to a model M uh, prime. And uh, this new knowledge, as I was saying, uh, should be able to uh, trigger a system evolution with a new system and of course, also a new model where the quality, the satisfaction metric QR of model M2 is better than the quality of uh, the starting model uh, M1. And uh, we call uh, this uh, chain of uh, transition virtuous chain because uh, it leads to uh, a, better, um, a better model. So this uh, type of uh, changes uh, should be promoted because uh, um, they um, can lead to a better version of the system. And so they should be promoted and also exploited to, to improve the system itself. So um, we have the need to uh, include a new uh, mean in our uh, taxonomy, in our taxonomy of dependability that we call a change triggering and uh, uh, exploitation. So what about uh, anti-fragility? Uh, we started with anti-fragility, we defined uh, a conceptual framework, but uh, to understand how to place and if it is possible to place anti-fragility in uh, this uh, dependability taxonomy. So the definition uh, we gave before is that uh, uh, an anti-fragile system is not only able to resist shock, but also to get better. And the knowledge changes uh, seem the right way to achieve anti-fragility because uh, it allows uh, an improvement of the system. And so we propose uh, this uh, definition of a system as anti-fragile if it implements the virtuous chain that uh, we have uh, defined before. So an anti-fragile system should be able to both trigger the occurrence of knowledge changes and exploit these changes to improve itself. At this point, uh, taking uh, always uh, in mind that this is the definition of dependability we are referring to, uh, we can change uh, the means uh, to attain uh, um, dependability, including uh, uh, in all uh, the, the type of means also the change word. And then uh, we can add uh, the new uh, category we have uh, defined the change triggering and exploitation. And the last, uh, extension that we propose is to include at this point anti-fragility as an attribute of dependability that can be um, related to knowledge changes and uh, change triggering and exploitation as means uh, to uh, achieve the dependability. So this was the first step. And uh, now that we have uh, uh, this new um, taxonomy. Uh, the next step is uh, being able to assess uh, the anti-fragility of a software intensive system. And to do so, we need to be able to define suitable anti-fragility metrics and, of course, a methodology for their evaluation. And uh, uh, in our view, these uh, metrics uh, should uh, allow us uh, to be able to quantify uh, both the system ability to learn and uh, the ability to apply this knowledge to uh, evolve and uh, improve itself. The, the questions that we are posing ourselves and uh, we don't have answer uh, um, is uh, in which way uh, can we exploit existing metric and uh, strategy from dependability, uh, which one, uh, how, and, uh, and so on. So after that, uh, we started thinking how this conceptual framework we have defined uh, can be translated 
um, in a software uh, into a software architecture. And we started thinking uh, um, at the self-adaptive systems uh, uh, architecture. And, um, and this was our first uh, idea, but uh, um, we thought that it is not enough uh, um, taking uh, the classical architecture for anti-fragile system as is. Um, there has been also uh, in the last years a lot of proposal to extend the classical uh, MAP architecture, um, including new uh, level uh, doing learning and so on. And uh, so studying uh, the literature and uh, taking into account uh, uh, the conceptual framework uh, we have defined, uh, we, uh, we think that uh, a three-layer architecture inspired uh, by the one proposed by Kramer and Nagy in 2007, could be the right way to uh, architect um, anti-fragile system. We, really are using uh, uh, the same idea of um, the original architecture, at least for the two bottom uh, layers. And uh, uh, the main changes are done at the upper layer. Just a few words because it is a really matter of work in progress. Uh, the bottom layer, um, in component control was called in the original uh, architecture uh, is able to deal with uh, uh, what we call small scale uh, real changes. Um, in particular, uh, these kind of changes refer to uh, the subset of real changes affecting only sigma or eta uh, with scope limited to a single component. And of course, uh, this uh, layer also uh, include uh, uh, all the activities, reporting and supporting functionalities for the higher level as uh, was true in, in the original uh, architecture. The middle layer, which uh, was called change management, uh, is able to, to deal with all the type of real changes, um, considering uh, any kind of element uh, in our system and not uh, only single components. And uh, again, uh, here it is possible to communicate with upper and uh, lower layer. Finally, uh, the upper layer, which uh, was called uh, goal management in uh, the original proposal, um, will be able to deal uh, with the requirement uh, change and also uh, we hope uh, with knowledge change. But to be able to deal with knowledge changes, then uh, we have to add uh, a couple of uh, new mechanisms in uh, this level. Uh, the first one is the change triggering uh, mechanism that should be able to, to favor the occurrence of knowledge changes, implementing mechanisms like uh, uh, fault injection or uh, adversarial machine learning technique or some other methods uh, related to chaos engineering, for example. And uh, this part, uh, of course, could be better to have it uh, offline, working uh, on a virtual duplicate of the real system because uh, trying to fade the system could, could not work well. And then uh, we have also uh, the learning and the exploitation mechanism uh, that should uh, allow the improvement of the system quality and also the learning of new aspects that were not predefined. And uh, these two set of mechanisms should work together uh, by triggering the knowledge changes and then exploiting them uh, through uh, suitable uh, mechanisms. So in our example at the bottom layer, we will see uh, self-check and self-healing self operation at nodes level. Uh, while uh, for the middle uh, layer, we uh, uh, see mechanism able to analyze the model topology to find the nodes that act as a cluster and uh, send to them a signal to uh, proactively self-heal. 
uh, while in the upper level, uh, for example, uh, we see the possibility to apply uh, chaos engineering, for example, methods and study its effect, its effect in order to, to gain the new knowledge about uh, vulnerability of connected nodes and how uh, the malware actually spreads uh, among the different system nodes. So this is uh, the final idea uh, of our uh, of our architecture and uh, covering uh, the vision of uh, um, anti-fragile system. Um, okay, so as for the future work, we have uh, okay up to now we have uh, we have tried to understand uh, how to include antifragility in the dependability taxonomy and uh, to do so we have introduced a new type of change uh, called uh, knowledge changes and uh, we are also trying to understand how uh, to include the, the different type of changes in a software architecture uh, of, as i was saying before the next step concerns the assessment of the antifragility and also uh, we would like to understand how to classify and manage uh, the uncertainty that then lead to changes uh, taking into account aspects uh, for example, like uh, the propagation of uh, the, um, the uncertainty or the combination of different source, uh, sources of uncertainty. And uh, for what concerns the architecture, uh, well, we would like to exploit uh, uh, pattern and uh, tactics that have been defined so far uh, for reliability, for example, or for other attributes of dependability, trying to understand how uh, for that type of system, they can be um, used also uh, for anti-fragility. And that's all. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Rafaela, for a very insightful uh, talk. Um, questions? At least for now, yeah. Uh, Janaina? Okay, thank you, Rado. Uh, very nice talk, Rafaela. I really enjoyed a lot. And um, um, I have a, a couple of questions, but mostly uh, from your perspective, how you see the next steps from this. Um, one of them is um, that I um, I wonder, for example, uh, the ability for us to, uh, um, let's say, to uh, optimize based on those changes, how we do, for example, the verification loop, especially at runtime, right? So let's say um, you have the knowledge that you preserve, but, uh, but you have also the knowledge that you evolve. And then yeah. let's say you want to, um, just to reuse part of the knowledge that you had already, but then you don't need to redo that again. So techniques like memoization, where they do some um, computational uh, uh, performance, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, you can really reuse or cache some of the verification that you've done before, and then you can reuse that. And particularly in the in this area of anti-fragile system, do you think that it would be possible to do it in a safe way? Because then if it does, then maybe this is something that uh, would be very interesting for us to, to see like, I'm sure it is not easy, <laughs> and uh, and that uh, this kind of uh, approach uh, opens a lot of uh, challenges, and that's why when, for example, I was uh, citing the change triggering part, uh, I was mentioning the possibility to to have um, a sort of digital twin on which we can uh, do our experiments and uh, trying to understand uh, how to how the system is able to. Evolve. Then I'm not an expert on uh, the modeling of knowledge, even if uh, I have used uh, 
different approaches, but I'm sure uh, here maybe there are uh, expert people able to understand how, for example, to incrementally um, change uh, the knowledge or uh, uh, if it is possible to maintain a different version. Um, so honestly, we didn't uh, apply it, as I was saying, it is... Uh, uh, something which is uh, at the beginning. So I don't have uh, a real example in which uh, we have applied that. Uh, the example I used uh, was just for in, in, to illustrate uh, uh, the terminology and the steps, but uh, I don't have uh, a real example. And uh, Diego, Vincenzo, whenever you want to, to say something, feel free. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I can imagine because um, because especially when you talk about um, some some safety constraints, of course they, they have like a more specific context of application. Uh, but um, you also there are parts of it that you really you can optimize that, and you don't because of course I mean not all the system has to be verified from scratch because you're not concerned with the safety from the whole system. And I'm, I'm mostly concerned about the verification step itself and how you can optimize that to make, if possible, I know that uh, uh, some, some colleagues from the safety community would kind of have some goosebumps and talk about verification, rota verification for safety critical systems. But I was just wondering if, uh, for example, if you have something and then preserve the knowledge and then you can say, okay, so this part is safe and then you can re-verify this, but then the other part that you can do some flexibility in terms of, um, runtime verification, then you can say, okay, so this thing that is really safety critical, you don't do this kind of change in, mm -hmm. a, let's say, on the fly, and then you can preserve that, but the parts that you can touch or you can re-verify, then you can do it. So uh, you have more flexibility and maybe some steps toward runtime verification for safety critical systems could start to happen. I don't know. It could be. We, we didn't focus on a safety critical system, and I imagine that uh, something uh, like uh, an approach you are uh, describing now would be more uh, suitable for this kind of system, because there are parts that cannot be uh, changed uh, easily. Uh, but maybe uh, understanding how an attack to this part uh, work could be interesting as well, uh, but done offline, of course. Um, Thank you very much, Rafaela. Thank you. You are welcome. Hmm. Um, other questions? Yeah, I certainly have a question. So one thing that I wanted to ask is that, do you think that like, adaptation, anti-fragility could be maybe reactive or proactive? Should it be proactive? I would uh, think this uh, um, change triggering indeed uh, is going towards the uh, proactive part because uh, in, this, in this way we, we are trying to understand what will happen and uh, we are trying to force uh, uh, something that uh, uh, is not uh, happening up to now, but when we are forcing it to understand uh, the effect of uh, these possible uh, changes and then uh, in case uh, um, adapting a proactive way to, to, improve, uh, to improve the system. If I have correctly understood the question. Yeah, I was thinking that we need to prod the environment in order to try to learn more, sort of seek um, the these yeah. changes or seek hazards. That could be, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. if you have the appropriate uh, um, equipment, maybe to mm -hmm. do so mm -hmm. without actually risking the safety critical systems. Uh, yeah. Um, re uh, violation of requirements. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I is there work that you've come across uh, in which insights from how humans achieve anti-fragility uh, can be exploited maybe for technical systems as well? Because we, we do operate in this way, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. But the usual uh, example that uh, is given when uh, describing antifragile system is the human uh, immune system. Um, that's uh, when it is attacked, uh, it learns how to, um, to deal with uh, a new kind of uh, virus and then uh, it evolves uh, to be able to deal with it better uh, the following time. This is the example that usually is uh, included in the antifragile system description. Yeah, it uh, reminds the, uh, the work done, uh, yeah, uh, with autonomic system when um, the, the brain, the, the, the human brain was considered yeah, as an example of uh, adaptation indeed. No, no, very, very interesting work. I see that a lot of um, the, the anti-fragility that, that you kind of recommend at this stage builds on acquisition of maybe new knowledge so that yeah. there is a lot in having the model uh, improved, basically allowing you, I assume, to, to use the actions from your repertoire of actions in, in a better way. Do you think it should be possible to, to also expand the, the uh, actions that you have in your repertoire somehow? Uh, that could be uh, indeed one, uh, one of the goal. Uh, because uh, it should, uh, yeah, if there is a change that uh, um, indeed uh, lead to a system evolution that uh, include a new uh, operation, new action, uh, that would be uh, the idea. I, I don't know how to, but ideally that, uh, is the case, but only ideally. I don't know, I don't have an example now of how. Yeah, yeah. Quite, quite interestingly, in, in the uh, research institute here, one, one level down from where we stand, where we have in a lab this uh, system where robots 3D print other robots, mm -hmm. trying to uh, use uh, um, genetic evolution like uh, oh. approaches mm -hmm. with the aim of uh, ending with robots, mobile robots that, that have the capability to, uh, mm -hmm. um, to, to withstand better what the environment throws at them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that, that's one idea. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What we have found reading uh, about uh, antifragility is uh, usually uh, something, just the definition I gave at the beginning, uh, the system gets better. And then uh, the, the diagram uh, that I show as well, uh, saying that uh, the system uh, is able to, to be better. But uh, it is not easy to find uh, uh, something which is systematic and that uh, compare this, uh, this new uh, uh, quality attribute, if you want, with something uh, which exists, uh, um, also to be able to exploit what already is there. And um, so that was the reason uh, of uh, our direction of research up to now. But yeah, uh, it is really uh, the beginning. Yeah, yeah, so we, we had this interesting keynote that seems in 2020, I'll send a link in, in the chat about uh, evolving uh, robot software and yeah, hardware. Thank you. Uh, that might, might be of interest to some of the yeah. people here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Uh, you, you wanted to ask another question, Jermaine, or is that an... Yes, I do, but I see that Sinem has another question. So I, I will uh, just favor her question, then I follow my... No, uh, you know, I have just uh, give me... Um, well, would you I... like to ask your question, Sinem, please? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering from the terminological point, uh, how does... Um... Yeah, antifragility differ from resilience. Yeah, you have yeah. a another slide. Yeah, I have. A, yeah, I have a couple of slides because uh, resilience, anyway, uh, is um, 
can be uh, compared, can be included in dependability because the system is able to resist uh, uh, and then uh, go back to the normal. Uh, to the normal behavior. Instead, with anti-fragility, not only the system resists, but also it gets better. And that's the difference. And uh, no, and uh, I just uh, add a couple of slides about resilience because uh, resilience as well can be included uh, in, in the taxonomy of Abizianis and uh, colleagues and uh, because, uh, okay, resilience uh, um, has been used uh, as a term uh, or to denote uh, uh, some specific uh, approach that can be adopted uh, to cope with uh, fault. And so in this case, uh, uh, it is uh, um, a method for fault tolerance or it is fault tolerance itself. And uh, otherwise uh, it has been defined as, uh, in this way as the persistence of dependability when uh, facing uh, changes. And um, so um, resilience uh, uh, has this double uh, meaning. And uh, when uh, defining the original uh, taxonomy, the, our uh, colleagues uh, had a similar problem with reliability, which uh, uh, was defined both uh, as uh, the concrete uh, metric, but also uh, to describe uh, a general property of the system. And uh, what they did was to introduce the dependability term and uh, include the reliability as an attribute. So we, we compared the definition of the resilience and uh, since, uh, as I say, dependability is the ability to deliver service that can be trusted. Resilience is the persistence of dependability when facing changes. And so if uh, we uh, just substitute the fault with change, we change uh, we can define a resilience uh, just merging uh, the, the two parts uh, uh, above, saying that it is uh, the persistence of the ability of a system to deliver service that can be uh, trusted when facing changes. And in this case, resilience is at the same level of dependability in the taxonomy. Uh, sorry for the long answer. Uh, since it was something uh, uh, which uh, we discussed a lot, uh, this uh, resilience, anti-fragility, dependability stuff, I didn't include uh, the beginning uh, uh, the slides because I wanted to focus on anti-fragility, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah and thank maybe. you. Maybe anti-fragility is the derivative of resilience, right? Uh, we, yeah, well, we were also considering that, but uh, Vincenzo, you can help me here. But uh, uh, we, we started thinking also in this direction, but it seems it could be true for a subset system, at least for the stationary one. But yeah, uh, in a way it is, in a way it is. Right, so may, maybe time for a quick final question uh, from uh, Janaina. Yeah, um, since you are reviewing the taxonomy from um, the uh, Vizienis group, um, that, that classical seminal work, I was wondering if you also considered um, also uh, when they talk about the time and data, time and data um, uh, failures and also the catastrophic consequences um, of uh, the failures, because then also I think that could help here in the definition to see maybe more clearly when, for example, they say that the minor, uh, the major consequences are when they are affecting the environment, uh, the business or the people related, and maybe the consequences here of, let's say, in case um, one of, um, a breach of the system happens, then this could cause a major damage to the system or to the environment or to people. Maybe uh, the same the same tone as you mentioned before here about resilience. I was wondering if maybe it could go just one step. No, I'm, sure, I'm sure it could uh, it can go further. Uh, assigning, uh, for example, severity levels or uh, uh, kind of uh, yeah, we, we just stopped at the first level, and uh, but of course uh, it can be 
expanded and uh, maybe also as you were saying uh, can lead to a more precise uh, definition of uh, anti-fragility yeah right i think we will uh, stop here thank you again uh, rafaela for this interesting presentation and also to uh, vincenzo and uh, diego for uh, uh, contributing to the work very nice to uh, see everyone again at these seminars in 2023 and i'm looking forward to uh, the seminar in two weeks time thank you thank you thank you bye